Hey, welcome everyone. I'm here today with Mark Fister, the author of Across the Board, and he's done work with more than 800 boards and board committees. Mark, how are you doing today? Travis, good to see you and uh, pleasure to be on your show today. Oh, I, I love these things. I know that I get probably more questions about boards and board governance and other than fundraising. That's the, the biggest area of questions that I get. Uh, why don't you give us the audience a little bit about your background? Sure, sure. Well, the, the long story short is I come from a very technical background in science, engineering, and technology. And uh, in my early career of being in that space, it was very noticeable that the uh, leadership in those particular verticals, uh, although they were extremely smart people, of course, and very technical, uh, the leadership commonly lacked in those areas. So for me, it was kind of a niche area that I started to work my way into. Um, and that, of course, over the years led through different uh, titles and positions to sea level and then uh, in, into the boardroom. And uh, today I kind of share that space as both a non-executive board director, uh, but also one of my joys, I'll say, in a very fulfilling area is acting as a chief board consultant for many of the both, I'll say, nonprofit, private and public organizations that I consult and advise. So it's uh, it's been an interesting path. It hasn't been the straightest of paths, uh, as, as most people may think about in their careers. Uh, but it's been extremely fulfilling, and uh, my passion is in strategy and governance, which is a perfect fit for, for the board space. Oh, that's fantastic. And I don't know about the people listening here, but I'm not a fan of the straight and narrow path because there's not a lot of learning and not a lot of growth on that straight path. It's not to where you you focus on one area, then, uh, then over time you become multidisciplinary, and when you start getting multidisciplinary, you raise realize how many similarities exist in all these different areas, which makes it easier uh, to spread your reach and your value. Now, I know you're the author of Across the Board, which is a fantastic book that I've been reading over the last couple of days. Um, the insights in here uh, aren't really, in the first half, aren't really like earth shattering or groundbreaking, but you give a lot of background, a lot of history, of how you give like expectations of a great board, traits of a great board, what that looks like, and then the history getting into like strategy and a little bit of politics, not political sides, but like how that builds into what we have as a board. Can you give us a little background on, on the board in general and what that looks like? Sure. Well, the, the whole gist of the story or, or the background and the teaching of this book uh, is, is focusing on what I view as the most prevalent issue and challenge for boards. And that is true of public, private, and nonprofit space. And maybe even more so in the nonprofit space, which has to do with what I view as this modern architecture behind a board, how the board is structured. Uh, I personally believe that the structuring issue of all types of boards or all entity types of boards, um, 90 plus percent of their problems or inefficiencies are due to the fact that they were not structured properly from the beginning. So in my consulting and advisory world, uh, I always joke, I say it was like that movie Groundhog Day where every day or every board I got involved with, uh, it started to always point back to the fact that it wasn't necessarily the issue uh, to solution that that board brought me in for or the cause of it was not necessarily where they think they had uh, pinpointed it. It always or, or very commonly came back to the fact that the board was not structured properly or what I say architected properly from the beginning. So in the book it walks through some of the background and the history of and I'll say the trending also of where boards are headed today and looking back over a significant amount of time. Uh, I'm always a believer that you have to know where you came from to know where you're going. So it's extremely important to understand the trending and the evolution of boards uh, over the past uh, 50 plus years, or maybe even more so. Uh, to your point, I also get into the background and history of strategy. Um, it's, it truly is a shame that today when we talk about boards, the initial word or what I call your parallel word that pops into your mind is governance. I actually think that should be the second word. The first word should be strategy. And mm -hmm. then the next word, if you think about a board or a board director, uh, the next word after strategy should be governance. And the reason for that is that you truly can't govern something if you don't understand the strategy, which leads you also to understanding of the goals. It doesn't work the other way around. Um, so, so thinking about that, and it's this, this is truly the, the foundational issue with most uh, senior leaders and board directors is that they step in with the mindset of governance 
but they haven't spent the time or the due diligence on understanding the goals and the strategy and how those are linked. And then the full circle of that, which is how are they going to oversee and measure those goals and those strategies? So very simply, the, the first portion of the book talks about those components. It walks you back through uh, a significant amount of time in, in the history and the development of governance and strategy mm -hmm. and brings you to this present day with all these challenges around that. That to me truly is foundational for a board director they have to understand that to then move into why would they structure or architect their board in a certain way. It all leads back to that uh, earlier trending and, and the evolution of where we're at today. Um, so I think at the point, uh, Travis, that you're at, you're at in the book right now, you're going to slowly get into this the structuring components uh, that truly walk through this building of an efficient and effective board for any entity type, inclusive of nonprofits. You know, from my experience of, of working on boards and being, you know, in the military where everything is run by departments and you have meetings and they're pretty close to, to board like structure. If you don't have a structure in place, if you don't have that solid foundation, that architecture, if you will, you're really at the whim uh, of the cult of personality. Who's the big dog in the room? Are they, you know, bullying and pushing people around? Is anything actually giving, getting done? And is, the bureaucracy and the rules written in the organization really prevent people in the organization from taking action or making that board process really slow moving. And in today's world, especially with the digital age, with COVID, with all these things happening, I don't think you can really afford to have a large slow board, but you more a small agile board and reactive, able to move. What does that look like and and how what is your opinion on the size of the board or the structure as it relates to uh, really like bureaucracy? Sure. Well, we're, we're in this realm right now, which I find quite strange. I, I've always been a process related person because I understand that process doesn't necessarily have to be a hindrance to progress. Uh, and a recent article, article I wrote about this was that in certain organizations, the board is actually being pushed to the side when it comes to what's called innovation governance. So uh, a quick example of this is in, in Microsoft and a few other very large technology companies, they purposely have asked the board not to be involved in any of the governance or the strategy oversight of their innovation groups because they view uh, governance as a hindrance to innovation and to progress, which it's beyond me how a board could actually be separate from that because what you're basically saying is that the board no longer has any type of oversight or input into the vision, the, the future of what that company wants to be because they jettisoned the responsibility of even understanding what the innovation areas are doing. So the board now becomes very laser focused on the mission, what they do well now, but they have very little view of the vision, which is what they want to do or enable in the future. So looking at that mindset that a board is a hindrance uh, or a, uh, in some way diminishes the effectiveness of an organization is just unbelievable for me to think about, not to mention the, the risk and the liability that it puts on a board director or a C-level in an organization. Um, so you know, to, to answer your question in this is that, um, I'm a fan of having processes that act as guardrails, but not so much where it's defining every single task. I mean, that never works. Uh, a great example of this in senior leadership, and I write a little bit about this in the book, is that a board that understands the goals, the goals of an organization are the what and the why, right? And then if you view strategy in those same simple terms, strategy is solely the how. How are we going to get this done? So if you were to peel back my mind right now and I was in a boardroom and I was hearing a presentation or getting data or information from somebody that was proposing something that we were going to vote on, I would think very specifically, tell me the what and the why first, which is the goal. Can I match that to a goal that the board right now is overseeing or interested in? The what and the why is the goal. And then I'm, I'm intently listening to how are you going to achieve that goal? Right, with, uh, with the guidelines of being uh, in, in, under the purpose of the organization and the, the values and the culture of the organization, of course, you're overlaying those, those requirements as well. But um, I'm intently listening to the how, which is the strategy, because there can be multiple hows in how you get to the support of your goals uh, and also the what and the why of the organization. 
And I think this is one of the biggest misses right now that a board is viewed as this hindrance to, to your question when they can actually, by asking the right questions, they can guide leadership, whether that be the CEO of a private or a public organization or the executive director or CEO of a nonprofit. Just by asking those questions, they are meant to elevate the outcome of the discussion, period. That's all it's there for. Mm -hmm. uh, so so there's, there's a couple of principles I mentioned here, and it's really about the thought process. When you move from a C-level into a board-related responsibility, to me, there should be a, a shift that happens in your mind where you say, I'm going to give go from giving direction 80% of the time and asking questions 20% of the time as a CEO or an executive director, I'm going to now put on a different hat. I'm going to ask questions 80% of the time and give my opinion or my input or my experience the other 20%. And I think that's some of this missed to answer your question again of, you know, why are we going down this path where a board is potentially viewed as a hindrance? And if there's processes that are in that board, uh, you know, does that hold us back? I don't believe that's the case. And, you know, having worked with hundreds of boards, uh, when they get that mindset correct, they, they, it clicks, they get it. And it's, it's unbelievable the, the progress and the processes that are, are just, the, it's it's incredible the the change in, in the productivity of those boards. Oh, absolutely. And well, when I deal with uh, with the nonprofit architect, largely is startup organizations. So, kind of idea through five years of operation, they're trying to figure all this stuff out. And I talked to some, I talked to you know, hundreds of of small nonprofits, and I asked them a question or present an idea, like, "Oh, I'm going to have to spin that through your board." And I was like, "Okay, I understand. That's why you've got it set up." I'm offering you a almost no time, a no cost, easily implementable thing to help your organization. And you're telling me that you need to wait three months to run this by your board. That seems like there's a, a problem in the way it's structured. Like, are you the chief executive officer or are you the chief ask the board everything officer? What exactly. does your organization look like? And I know you've seen this out in your world. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really comes back to, again, you know, a board director should very quickly be able to size up any request uh, or anything that could be valuable or detrimental to the organization by simply going through a, a, a very, uh, talk about process again, a thought process or a decisioning process that can start out with the values of the organization, which also sit with its goals, uh, then moving to the uh, the planned accomplishments of the organization and the board for that time period. So there can be very easy set processes. And these are many things I talk about in the consulting work that I do to help boards get to the point where each individual board member, they're still operating independently because you don't want to lose that independence of their thought process or the, uh, the, the diversity of their, uh, of their input, of course. Uh, but it's helpful for them to also have a a vetting process of how they go through a question or something that's been proposed. And if you can put that through a process that starts at a very high level, again, values of the organization, is that a fit? Yes, it is. Okay, let's move to the next level of this. Does it fit our, our future vision? Yes, it does. Then does it fit our mission of the organization, which is what we do well or want to do well now? Uh, by doing that and filtering those things through the organization, if, if each board director is able to do that, you'd be amazed at how quickly you can get to uh, very valuable decisions that have been vetted, uh, the due diligence is done quite quickly. And if it's not a fit, you're not spending days, weeks, or months talking about it. You already know it doesn't fit one of those hierarchy components of your decision making. So until we either fix that uh, or we just say it's not right for us, we're going to move on to something else and it's more valuable to the organization. But there's this paralysis, Travis, that's happening right now in decision making. Uh, and, and one last thing to mention about that is that there's a, there's a concept out there right now that talk what, what I've named governance simultaneity. And the problem with this is that there are so many things happening at one time. And, and COVID, this whole pandemic has really brought this to the forefront where everything kind of kicked in at once. Boards were dealing with uh, pushing now the, the, the organization to do their digital transformation, which they pushed, for, pushed off for the last 10 years. And now they have to do it because of their, the remote nature of, of their workforce. Um, decisions of, of evaluations and effectiveness of, of workers that were historically in place and, and, and not remote, and now they're working remote or work from home. Um, you know, so many things happened at once, and many of these boards were just not prepared for it. They didn't, they didn't have a way of systematically 
and effectively working through these challenges and this governance simultaneity just buried so many of these boards. Oh, I can I can definitely understand that and how that looks and how that looks like. Uh, I want to bring up a quote from the book that I thought has real relevant uh, revel, relevance. That's the word relevance and impact <laughs> in the decision making process. Roy Disney, it's not hard to make decisions when you know where your values are. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I challenge uh, both executive leaders as well as board members to say, before you request the data and you're posed with a challenge or a question, think first and foremost to your own values and the organization's values. And if you only based it on those components, what would your answer be right at this moment? And Roy Disney was a master at this. Uh, um, he, he basically would take questions or problems that were brought to him and he tested this out for uh, some period of time where he said, before I even request all the data and the other input, he says, if I had to give you an answer right now based on the values of the organization, this is what I would say. And start down that path and then I'm going to get back to you and just as soon as I can, once I have the data. And he found out that almost 100% of the time that the values based decision and answer that he gave um, immediately was again, almost 100% of the time backed up later on by the data or the decision-making of other folks that were also looking at the values, the purpose, uh, the culture of the organization, which to me should be the first areas that are looked at as part of decision-making, not necessarily the, the data uh, or the things that you would uh, Google <laughs> and find information on. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the culture and the purpose of the organization that should be and the values that should be looked at first in decision-making. And you would think this would be common sense being that anything you do with a nonprofit organization really must point back to meeting the mission. So it, it almost isn't needed, but I think it's a great small little snippet, a little bit piece of micro content that reminds us exactly what it is that we're doing. If you are running an organization and the, I don't know, the desktop screensaver, a big poster next to your desk, isn't the mission and impact you desire to have then what are you really doing? Are you just That's doing right. the daily tasks? Are you just going through the, the wheel that you've created and you're just a cog in the wheel? Or are you pointing everything back to that mission, that vision, that impact? One, it keeps you on task and on track. Two, it keeps your motives pure and you it helps you avoid that mission creep, that, that shiny object syndrome like, oh, that looks interesting over there. Let's go check that out. Well, in business, we might call that a detractor from dollar producing activities. How much time are you spending every day on something that's not a dollar producing activity? Or if you're in the nonprofit world, not related to governance, fundraising, or your actual impact that you're making your programs. If you're not related your activities to one of those three things, then what are you really doing? Are you doing a minutiae right. farmed out? Do you have your top level guys working on something they have no business spending time on? What does that look like? What have you seen in the boards that you've come across? Well, there's a mix right now. I mean, the boards that have truly put the effort into their structuring, or again, as I like to call it, their architecture, um, they're fairly good at keeping on track because they have the processes in place to allow for that. And they also have the culture on the board that basically states that they're policing themselves individually, and they're also policing the overall board. So many times when the board, individual board members are given that power, and by the way, they have to do that in a respectful way. Right, it's not just cutting somebody off. It's saying that you're allowing for discourse. You're allowing for what I like to call respectful dissent, which is a way of uh, opening up uh, deliberation and debate in such a way where nobody feels like they're being personally attacked. It's the idea that's being vetted to allow to allow it to come to a better outcome. Um, and you know, boards that have some of these basic principles in place, they've discussed them, they've documented them as an example, maybe even in their bylaws or in their operating agreements of how the board's going to operate. Uh, those boards definitely, they, they've, they've taken away what they view as only the technical components of board operations, and they've added the personal or interpersonal type of aspects to it as well, which is most important for the communication. You're never gonna get a group of people in a room. If it's more, if it's more than two or more people, you're never gonna get 100% of the agreement all the time. But if you're focused 
and the, and, and the folks on the board, which I like to measure for this, which is their EQ, their emotional intelligence, and their MQ, their mindfulness intelligence. You'll get to that shortly in the book, Travis, by the way, also. <laughs> it's a way of evaluating the maturity of that decision maker's ability to allow for discourse, but not take it as an example, as a personal attack on them, right? Um, it's, it's a way of, if you're delivering a message, are you mindful of, you know, if, if you're challenging something and you know the board director next to you uh, that's sitting next to you worked on this thing for six months, are you just dismissing it in terms of its theory, its idea, and all the effort that's put into it? Or are you mindful of the fact of all the effort and the fact that it's a passion of that person, but you still want to question it? So it's a give and take on both sides. The mindfulness is in your delivery and the emotional side or the emotional intelligence side of this is how you receive things and then how you react to those areas. These boards that are looking more deeply, you know, if, if I correlate this Travis back to, to the across the board book, you know, most boards focus very specifically on what I view as the, the step one. Step one is what's called a sphere of influence. It's which people and which skill sets do you have on your board, period. Most boards stop there. The next step, that I think is critical, uh, which is more the horizontal view of your board, uh, which adds what I view as the character of your board is, have you evaluated or even trained the board uh, to be more in tune with other areas of importance to the board? A great example of this is uh, a board that has all of the same personality type in their people, which happens because everybody on the board is looking for people like them. So all of a sudden you have all the same personality types. Whereas I immediately look for balance on a board if I'm doing an evaluation, I'm looking for a balance of an analyst, uh, a diplomat, a sentinel, which is a protector and an explorer. If you're missing any one of those personality traits or one of those belief traits on a board, you're going to make bad decisions. It's not possible because as, if you're missing an, an explorer, as an example, right? You're possibly not looking forward enough because that's the explorer. They're always looking at the next new shiny thing. Right. But that person by themselves in the decision making capacity is not great because they may not be focused on the mission, the current mission. Right. So the current mission is going to be protected in most cases by the sentinel. That wasn't what we set out to do. It's not in the bylaws. These are the types of comments you'd hear from a sentinel. Uh, and the diplomat then, of course, is another viewpoint of, of looking at this balance on a board of saying, well, let's make sure we hear everybody and they'll try to keep the discussion civil and, and of course, getting to the, to the components that allow them to make a, a savvy decision. And then, of course, the analyst is the person that wants their data. They want to know that this is uh, backed up in some way. But you, you can see the balance of those personality types really add to the, the validity and the outcomes of decisions of any type of decision making group not to mention, of course, a board. So these are some of the balance areas to look at that add the character to your board, which is where you get out of just somebody making a statement or asking a very pointed question in their expertise area. There's no depth to that. There's really no value to that. I tell you, as you're describing the different characters on a board, uh, I immediately flash back to all the different times I was each of those different characters, depending on what the situation uh, dictated. I'm like, why are we not looking into new things? Why are we just you know, stuck with the status quo? We're looking at this like, it sounds expensive. We looked at the numbers on this. Like, I understand that everyone has different viewpoints. I'm like, let's take a look and see what everyone else has. And sure. like, are you yes. anywhere near the mission with this idea right now? Are we talking about changing our mission statement and finding out with our 990 so the whole world knows and the IRS knows that we're migrating our mission? And I've used a statement like that to really rein people back in. They were like, what are you talking about? That's not what mm -hmm. I meant. Well, yeah. it has absolutely nothing to do with our mission. So what are we talking about? Why are we spending time on this? Yeah. And mo most people do have a, an aspect of touching uh, in their personality type on each one of those four areas I mentioned. But it's my experience that most people have a dominant trait when it comes to either analyst, diplomat, sentinel, and explorer. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I just want to know if I'm looking at architecting a board, I want to know if we have gaps in any of those areas, because each one of those types uh, is, is, again, they're instrumental in getting to a great, not just a good outcome, but a great outcome in the decision making uh, of that board. And if you overlay, of course, that process that I mentioned that starts with the comparison of values, vision, vision mission, uh, and then work through even down to the question of the operational or implementation capability of the organization, um, 
you know, these overlays of looking at those steps in a slightly different way, a slightly diverse way, uh, it's absolutely amazing when that decision-making process is in place, the outcomes you can get to and quickly. You know, there's, there's not just the effectiveness, but there's the efficiency component of that process as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I always find myself kind of being the guy that uh, on the board is asking the, the uncomfortable question. <laughs> I'm not okay with just casual compliance on whatever's being brought up. I want to know, I want to know if this has been challenged. I want to know if this has been thought through. Is this something we're just saying yes to because of a cult of personality, or is this something that's really going to have that positive impact for the organization that's going to move us forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when we talk about structuring of this, if, if we just add a little component to this uh, that I view as another parallel type concept, if we talk about board committees, as an example, you know, I can tell you uh, firsthand that many boards, if, if we go back in the nonprofit space, if we go back to this, this issue with the lack of, of true architecture or the effort put into the architecture, um, you see a, a, a disparate mix of board committees. Some have certain board committees, some organizations lack board committees. But there's a trend, Travis, that I see in this, especially for nonprofits. And what this comes down to is that if I'm, if I'm reviewing the structure of a board, before I even look at the people on the board and their backgrounds and, again, personality types or, or decision-making approaches, whatever all those other components are, <coughs> I want to first look at what is the structure of the board in terms of its committees, because that has a direct component of your decision-making also. Um, so nonprofits that don't have the following or equivalent of the following three committees, I can tell you they are struggling now and they will always struggle and it's the following. One is a program committee, which is what exactly is it that this organization offers? What are the packages or the offerings of the organization? And is there a program committee uh, that is overseeing that and understanding not just what they offer, but is it something that people want or is there a need for it currently? Very simple question to ask. Those types of things should be housed within a, what I call the program committee. Um, a development committee, this has to do with uh, funding and, and grants uh, for nonprofits or even just, I'll say revenue streams or income type of streams for organizations. Um, when I mention these, Travis, I'm talking about the, not just the standalone committees, but the linkability or the linkages between those com committees and how they're working together. The third one is the marketing committee or, or what I like to view as the packaging committee, right? And that is how, is how is the program committee, what's being offered, working with the development committee of how it's going to generate revenue or income for the organization. How is the marketing committee then taking that and packaging that properly into things that are uh, able to be understood easily and, 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 and there's a need, you know, you package it in a way that there's a need for it. Those three committees I mentioned are all interlinked. And if you're missing one of them or even a person that doesn't have that experience on a nonprofit board, I can tell you they're going to struggle. It's, you see this, I've seen this across hundreds of boards I work with if they're missing one of those committee areas or an expert on the board uh, with that background. That's interesting. So we've got program committee, development committee and marketing committee. I know that from my experience with, with startups, uh, there's almost no marketing thought happening whatsoever. Uh, they don't, they're, they have a passion for the organization or the mission, vision, goals, impact, but they don't want to share it with the world. Yeah. And I point them to something like the Google ad grant where they can get up to 10 grand a month in free Google ads just for being a nonprofit. And I point them to my interview with Preston Cohen, but they're still like, yeah, but I don't know what to say. Well, don't let that stop you from trying. The best thing right. about marketing is you can put something out and if it doesn't work, you tweak it and you put something new out. Just like dinner, people get hung up on dinner. What am I gonna have for dinner? I don't know, if you mess it up, you can just fix it tomorrow or the next <laughs> day. Right. You're having another dinner right. coming up. It's no big deal. That, <laughs> it's that like just one meal is the end all be all. And it's like so many ideas that come into the board, you, you feel like that way. You feel like that idea that comes in is the end all be all of ideas. And then something like COVID happens and completely knocks you off your feet. And now you're left wondering, what are we going to do with this? That's right. That's right. And, you know, knowing that those three groups are working together properly, it allows for quicker pivots uh, in the organization. I mean, many nonprofits had to pivot during this time frame. Uh, everything from... Uh, available grants and donations uh, to people getting involved and 
you know, mainly not being able to do some of those face-to-face -face type interactions, which is usually where the trust is built and the connection is made. And that leads back into some sort of involvement or grant or donation from some, you know, from the personal aspect uh, of, of somebody being involved with a nonprofit. But keep in mind that marketing components, um, I like to look and do a comparison often of, uh, again, the program committee, development committee, and marketing committee, and understand if it's working well or if it's not working well because there's misses in that structure. Um, is that directly correlating to the board's ability, each individual board member's ability to raise funds, which is commonly a requirement of a nonprofit board director is to have the give or get, right? So interestingly, the trending in this is when, when there is alignment and progress uh, and, and, and true effectiveness and efficiency through program development and, and marketing, the board directors are on average more likely to be involved in the fundraising components because they know they have backup, right? They're not going to get caught in a scenario where they can describe what they offer the program um, how they go about getting donations and those things, but then they're out in the cold because there's no marketing material, nothing on the website they can direct that person back to to get that trust level, right? That's a common thing. Uh, likewise, if the programs are not properly documented or they're, not, they're disparate in some way and it hasn't been looked into uh, to the level which the, the due diligence that's required, you know, a board director is not gonna be comfortable in going out and representing that program because maybe it's not as impactful as it should be. You know, you're not going to go and ask somebody for a few thousand dollars donation if even you as a board director don't feel like the program uh, or the offerings are as impactful as they should be, right? This, this has so many uh, ties to it that uh, also affects the, the operation of the board directors, not, you know, and not just solely the organization. It's, it's a much bigger thing. Uh, I'm a huge believer in that you have to have that feedback loop. I just published last week, so it's uh, 16th of February when we're recording this thing. Last week, I published an interview with Sarah Lacarno, and she was a recipient of services from a nonprofit that I'm familiar with. So often we talk about all the inputs, you know, what is the board doing? What is the fundraisers doing? What are the volunteers doing? What are, what are all these inputs? And we forget about the outcome and how that makes sense. And there's no easier way to sell a product a service or your nonprofit, what you're doing, your impact is in having those testimonials. What is the actual impact you're, you're, you're having? If you're feeding the homeless, it's straightforward. It's very simple. You show pictures of you all delivering food to the homeless. Easy day. Keep bigger impact than that. You actually interview someone and say that they, you know, that I wouldn't have food without this program. Right. The impact, right. Impact. The impact. No one cares about your mission. You can have the best mission in the world. No one cares. What are you doing with it? What's the That's impact right. that you're having? That's right. You know, Colin Kaepernick did a great job of bringing awareness to the uh, the atrocities of some police departments across the U.S. Great. My problem with that is, what did he do once he had our attention? Not a lot, mm -hmm. right? Regardless if you think he should be playing in the NFL or not, whether kneeling was the right or wrong thing to do, I don't care about any of that stuff. You got our attention. Great. What are mm -hmm. you doing with it? And that's the problem that I have with a lot of nonprofits. What are you doing? What's, what's your mission? Cool. How are, you, how are you making that impact in your community towards your goal? And if you can't answer that question, you really have, you really don't have anything. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And look, I mean, in many cases, the, the expectations also for nonprofits have not been set to the same level of serving as a board director as compared to private and public organizations, right? So um, you'll get to a point uh, shortly in the book also, Travis, where I talk about what's called a board pitch book. And a board pitch book basically is many of the things I've talked about already uh, in our discussion today, uh, structuring, decision-making, uh, where that person fits if they are to join the board. These types of things are called out very clearly in what's called a board pitch book and shows uh, basically this board is about something, right? Values, vision, mission. Um, this is how we've structured it. This is why you will be so important to the board. This is where you fit. This is the committee you'll serve on or lead. Uh, and this is how everything fits together. Those board pitch books, uh, and this is again true for any entity type, it really makes a difference if you're approaching someone. I, I view it very similar to uh, if uh, someone's applying to college or if someone's graduating high school and they have their they have their safety schools they're applying to and they have their reach schools. 
and some in between on that, right? Well, a board pitch book allows you to go out to all those different groups, even what I call your reach group, folks that you would never in a million years think that would join your board. But when they see that you put the effort into creating this pitch book uh, that talks about structuring where they're gonna fit, the time commitment as an example is another huge misalignment for, uh, for nonprofit board directors, right? When all that's defined, it's impressive and all of a sudden the people that you thought were your reach people to join the board, they're all of a sudden all saying yes. And you're trying to figure out uh, how to manage all this now. It's pretty amazing. But you know, it just comes back to that preparedness uh, in a way that shows that you, are, um, you, have, you have put discipline behind not just the organization, but also discipline behind how you're structuring the board and how you're gonna make it as effective and efficient as possible. And, and a board pitch book is a great way to do that. That sounds uh, very similar to something I put together for one of my clients. It was really just a board questionnaire. And some of the questions in there that really had people thinking is, you know, do you have 10 hours a week to dedicate to this board? That's right. And it's not about the 10 hours per se. It's not like you got nine and a half and you're looking at firing a board member. It's not about that. It's understanding that there's going to be work to be done and that you're saying yes, that you are going to make time out of your weekly schedule to have an impact in this organization. And uh, my client was looking for new board members and she was hoping to get like maybe three people interested. She got 12 people interested. Mm -hmm. And just mm -hmm. like to your point, those, those reach candidates, uh, all five on five said they were interested in her being on her board and providing that mission, mm -hmm. vision, goals, impact, all that fun stuff. And yeah. she was blown away. She called me immediately. She's like, I don't know what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. Stop what you're doing and listen to what I have to say. She was so excited <laughs> about the response that she got. Uh, but what I really want to know is, is how do you actually structure a board intentionally? What are the things you look at? How do you line that up to make sure you're starting your board or recreating your board with the success that you want to have? Sure. For me, there's 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 three very uh, specific steps to to do this, and uh, I, I categorize them in, in in three named areas. One is what's called the board sphere of influence, and before you think of an individual person's name, before you think of somebody who would be great for the position eliminate all of that and just go to what are the requirements of this particular board in terms of skill set? What do we need? I mentioned a moment ago that balance between program committee, development committee, and marketing committee. Um, I can tell you that every nonprofit needs someone who's an expert in marketing. They need an expert in development, which is grants and, and donations and those types of areas. And there is a skill set for that. Uh, and also needs someone that has had a uh, had experience in developing programs for institutions or organizations. That's the key right now. So the sphere of influence is focused on that. It also looks at the level or ability of leadership. And then also, um, if I look at this in concentric rings in this step one, uh, I like to also understand what level of operational or operations experience uh, the board, uh, board as a whole or each individual board director has. And those components form this wheel that I call your sphere of influence, which is truly the first step in understanding what expertise do we need. So that's the vertical considerations of, of expertise. Then we move into something I mentioned earlier, step two of the construction or the architecture component, that's called your planes of congruence. And this is the area that's viewed as a horizontal. It could span across the entire board or have components that are looked at for individual board members. Uh, and this is what builds the character of your board. Some examples of this are evaluating a board member's uh, maturity in EQ, emotional intelligence, and MQ, mindfulness intelligence. Are they a great communicator? Is this someone who's going to take a, um, somebody not agreeing with them as a personal challenge or a personal attack on them, right? These are all underminers of getting to where you want to be. Another great example, as I mentioned, uh, for your planes of congruence, step two uh, is uh, your personality or leadership type traits, uh, which is that analyst, diplomat, sentinel, and explorer. Um, and I look for personally in boards that I architect and work with, I want to know we have deep experience with, with formal governance and formal strategy. Not just you had a title and of course I'm good at those things. That doesn't cut it anymore. There is a discipline for governance and there is a discipline for, for strategy as it applies to organizations and their size and their growth. All right. 
So those are just some examples of, of this. You could have diversity components that adds character to your planes of congruence, right? Uh, the, the at least 30% women on your board, uh, at least 30% or, you know, you, or you're aiming for 50% of previously underrepresented uh, uh, populations within your board makeup, right? Those are all character components of your board and your planes of congruence. And then third, thirdly, what's called coverage and balance. Coverage and balance of your board architecture or proper board architecture is looking at some level or degree of overlap uh, of the knowledge areas of the board. So number one, I'm looking for a subject matter expert in each one of the areas we defined in step one of your sphere of influence, right? Your expertise areas. I wanna know that I have someone who's an expert in each one of those particular knowledge areas. But that's not good enough, right? Because that person, and a great example of this is somebody who's brought in a board with cybersecurity knowledge and they're brought there for specifically that reason. Nobody else on the board commonly can challenge that person and what they propose, what outcomes they've come to. Um, so you have this bubble of, of decision-making in one area. I look for coverage and balance in this, which is, okay, I have the expert now, but who else on the board has some level of knowledge or expertise in this? There may not be a subject mm -hmm. matter expert, but if that, um, if that person that's, that's leading that committee or that technology and cybersecurity committee has someone else that has some level of knowledge can challenge them, now you're having a deliberation and a debate, right? It's not just someone says it, we all nod, nod our heads because we don't have experience in that space, right? That's the coverage and balance type of view. And those three components, that's the, that creates the depth of the board, by the way. So we said, we said your vertical component um, creates your expertise, that's mm -hmm. your sphere of influence. The horizontal component is your planes of congruence that creates your character. And then your coverage and balance that I just mentioned creates the depth of the board. If you can get those three areas balanced in some way, these boards are absolutely unstoppable and the value they bring to the organization is, is incredible. So I know I talked your ear off there, but those are the three and they're very easy to implement. You just have to have a plan for it. This is what the book, the book goes through that repeatable roadmap of how to do that. This is uh, fantastic. I hadn't considered having a marketing expert on the board that I've been a part of, boards I've been a part of that hasn't been a consideration, but being based on the discussion that we've had, that's a, not only a no brainer, that's a absolutely must have. Absolutely. Have someone, I, I mean, it's yeah. skills, of, skills of talking to the public, if nothing else, like how do you get your message out there? And remember marketing isn't solely just someone who's creating ads, right? What I'm saying with marketing is that marketing person can even educate the individual board members on what the programs are that the program committee came up with, how they're being packaged for developments, and then how you as a board director can talk about it, right? Even talking about something is marketing. And these are amazing gaps on nonprofits. You know, nonprofits at their heart, they are still, uh, you know, this is true of every organization. I, I believe every organization, Travis, is truly at its core. They're a technology and a marketing organization, period. If you're missing those components, it's almost impossible to stay in business today. You have components of those two areas in everything that's done. Yeah, absolutely. So where do you find all these magical people to fill up your board that you need all these <laughs> magical requirements and things? Where are these people located? I mean, is it uh, like a unicorn phone directory we go through and, and figure out who these well, people there, are? Yeah, I mean, there are organizations you can reach out to. I like to think that we've moved away somewhat from this uh, friends and family type of board appointments. But in all honesty, you're still going to have your, your best candidates are going to be those that you know or have worked with in some way, right? You have the personal experience of seeing how they operate. Um, commonly, it takes a little bit of time uh, to be with somebody to understand their values, uh, to understand their purpose, right? That doesn't always come out just in one or two or three or five interviews. It's really when you start to get into the nitty gritty of the organization that you truly see someone's character and what they're about. Uh, and if they're if they're adding to or undermining the culture, of course, that usually comes out later, unfortunately. But uh, there are, of course, placement organizations. Nonprofits don't tap into placement organizations as often as uh, private and public organizations. Um, but you know, I like to think that you're looking for folks that are, have some sort of discipline and background. Uh, LinkedIn is a great place to do searches, uh, and I'll tell you whether these large placement organizations. Uh, or executive search organizations admit it or not, they're using LinkedIn more than you may think. So it's important to have your profile properly done um, and representing yourself properly for this. Um, but 
looking for folks, uh, and it just maybe is a great point to bring up right now, Travis, in this is that you're looking for people that have a balance in the board director vertical of the following areas. They have expertise, which is what they know. They have experience, which is how they've applied it, right? And then the third one that's overlooked, but it's getting more traction now, is what I like to call proof or certification. And there are certifications that I view more as horizontal board uh, certifications that are out there right now. I, I've got a bunch of these myself. It shows that I view board directorship as a discipline. Um, but it also shows that I'm into continuous learning and you're looking for board directors that haven't just, that don't think that they've reached the pinnacle of their career because they're a board director, right? If anything, the amount of learning that's required is exponential to your previous non-board related role uh, because of the responsibilities you have. So remember, it's, 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 it's expertise, what you know, experience, how you've applied it, and then the certification or proof, which is showing that you view this as a discipline uh, and you're getting yourself educated and certified in those areas. So if you're looking for board members in the nonprofit space, don't think that that's only for public and private type boards. Look for people that understand how to operate in a board environment because you, don't only, you not only don't have to teach them, to do those things, but they are elevating the rest of the board by bringing in that knowledge and that discipline to, to the board. I tell you what, you brought up continuing learning there. And as someone that's in the military, that's in business, that's in nonprofits, it is my, it's like one of my pet peeves that people aren't taking ownership of their learning. And I'm not just talking about like formal courses or reading a book, even though I can recommend a great book by a great mm -hmm. author. It's, listening to a podcast. If you're listening to this show, I'm obviously not talking to you because you're listening to a podcast or reading audiobooks or having those discussions. Like, do your friends actually add value? When, when you have a discussion with your friend, do you, both of you walk away feeling elevated, like you've learned something, like you've been held accountable? Like that's what real friendship is. And so many of these startups, they're just in the business of doing. They're mm -hmm. not in the business of administering. They're not in the business of right. learning, they're in the business of doing, which is fine for a period of time. But there comes to a point where you don't have enough money because you've never learned how to fundraise. There comes to a point where your programs need to change, but you haven't learned anything new to That's deliver. Right. You haven't made new connections, new relationships, someone to bring more value into your organization. And you've stovepiped in the, you know, everyone has the same personality on your board. I'm looking for people that are going to challenge me or that are strong in areas that I'm weak. There's a lot of me, a lot of huge parts of me that's detail oriented, but some of this stuff I just don't want to do. I'm mm -hmm. going to find someone that's got those admin skills on lockdown to make sure that we're keeping track and keeping on point with all of the things that we need to have done. And if you're in the nonprofit world, you've got reports due to the IRS each and every single year that you gotta make sure you're following those compliance guidelines. Maybe you are the admin person, but you need someone to go and shout from the rooftops about what kind of organization you have, what kind of impact you're delivering and what you have planned for the future. That's where you need that, that marketing guy, that person that can go out there and, and help spread your message. Maybe you are the introvert and you have a hard time talking to people. Well, you better get an extrovert on your team. Yeah. <laughs> you or, get... or at the very least be given the tools to make it the discussion easier, right? Because even yeah. an introvert, if they have the right tools uh, you know, from a marketing viewpoint, it can be a very short discussion, but they've, they've generated interest. Uh, and they've just in doing that, they further the needs of the organization. If, if you are on your board and you can't easily answer the question, what is it that you guys do? If you're searching through the Rolodex in your head, trying to figure out how to say it, then you have no business uh, speaking on behalf of your organization. And if you can't speak on the, behalf of the organization, what are you doing there? That's right. One of the, the telling indicators or observables I use, and I'll, I'll wrap two of these concepts together in here. Um, one has to do just quickly going back to the learning environment. Um, I view that as one of the prime, what I call board observables uh, to see the maturity level of that board. Um, and boards that enact those type of behaviors that are positive to the learning environment, they may include a guest speaker coming in uh, to their board every, every quarter or every month uh, to, for on some topic that they need help with or want to learn more about. So that's one aspect. Um, the other side to this um, has to, uh, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. <laughs> um, the other aspect of this has to do with looking at 
the components, uh, again, just jumping back to the marketing components there, um, a very telling question, or again, another board observable you can, you can uh, use in, your, in, in the nonprofit board especially is asking each individual board member the following two questions. What is our mission and what are our values? And you would be amazed when I asked that question in my consulting realm, um, how many people don't know that? And some of them have been on these boards for years. The problem with that is that it goes back to there can be no mature decision-making process by not understanding first and foremost the values and secondly of course the vision and then thirdly the mission of what you're doing well now it undermines the whole process so i would say that every decision to that point to date is suspect because the the areas that you would compare against haven't even been considered your values vision and mission that is phenomenal. And those two easy questions can really help you evaluate if your board's on track or if they need some prompting. Yep. Um, Try it out at one point with, with, and I, I, to your listeners as well, you know, pose that, start the meeting off and ask uh, if anybody can recite the mission of the, or maybe start with all three, the values first, the vision second, and the mission third. See how many people can do it. You're going to be surprised. Not in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a great, you know, place to kind of recage where you're at as an organization and as a board. Uh, so this morning before we hopped on, maybe about 30 minutes before our interview, I posted on Facebook. I was like, what would you ask someone that's worked with over 800 boards? Like, what's your burning questions about boards? And I only got uh, two people that want to know, like, why on earth did you work with 800 boards? Uh, do you have any, any, uh, uh, any energy left in your life and, and you know why did you dedicate yourself to working with boards <laughs> well i mean for me what drew me into that realm uh truly had to do with if you want to make the biggest impact in an organization that should truly be at the board level now that's not always true i i, I came to find that out uh, over a decade ago that that belief was somewhat flawed when you start to drill into some of these board areas um, and I probably add to that now to say that it's not just the board, but it's also the relationship between the board and the CEO or, or the board and the executive director in the nonprofit realm. So um, when those relationships are working properly and, and they're good or even great for that matter, um, the strategy and the governance components can fall into place a lot easier. Um, but it's really, to me, the area where you can make the biggest impact, whether that be as a board director or in my case, as a board consultant, uh, in addition to being a board director, um, it's incredible the impact you can have on these organizations. And what I think is a fairly short amount of time, you know, if you're, if you're looking to make a change in an organization or transformation, uh, many cases, you're looking at a much larger group of individuals, right? Employees throughout the whole organization, their leadership to the C-level and then to the board. That's a that's a that's a, a big undertaking, but the board usually is is confined to maybe eight to fifteen individuals, uh, and it's you know it, it's more corralled. I'll say right? you, you've corralled everybody into one room. Still has its challenges, of course, but it's a smaller group to work with, and in many cases they do have the emotional intelligence and the mindfulness intelligence to really to drive everything forward. <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, another question from Facebook. My board is unengaged and they're not hardly doing anything that's asked of them. How do I reinvigorate and re-engage my board of directors? Mm -hmm. One is I, I like to say that you have to have some sort of catalyst that kicks this off, right? So um, to me, it's usually a reminder or a reiteration. Of, I'll go back to the values, vision, and mission. But then you have to make that real. And the easiest way to do that is, in my mind, in, in my opinion, and having done this with so many boards, is to go back and revisit the structure and the architecture of that board. By doing that allows you to say, do we have the right people? Many of the challenges you'll see on boards that have undermined the camaraderie of the board or even the motivation of individual board members has to do with the fact they don't feel effective or they don't feel impactful, right? To me, bring that back now to say, are we structured properly first and foremost to make progress, to make an impact, to make a difference? By doing that, you can also define the responsibilities of the board, right? You can start at the overall board level, talk about time commitments, talk about focus areas. Then you can move that to understanding, if we go back to the sphere of influence components of the expertise, correlate those back now to the committees that you're gonna have on your board. What are those committees and what are they responsible for? Create the charters that list out, I don't even care if it's just very simple bullet items, right? The bullet items can list out very specifically what the responsibilities of that board or that board committee are. And then 
correlate that to their involvement with the goal setting and the strategy, right? First, the goals, the what and the why, the strategy, which is the how. And then very simply, this is all at the same time, building the governance component. The governance component is now that we've decided our goals, we've discovered our how, let's go into the measurement of these. My clock is going there, sorry. <laughs> uh, the measurement of that now truly is your governance. Pick a few milestones that each one of the committees is going to be responsible for, and it could be five or six or 10 for the entire year. And during their reporting or their governance, they're talking about if they're on track or they're not on track to make those rolled up tasks into the milestones. Very easy way to, to look at this and to kick it off. But usually most boards are striving for some sort of structure to know that if they do it, others are going to be doing it as well. That offers up then the repeatable processes. It's a very easy way to show progress of what's being accomplished. Uh, and then of course that in itself raises the, the camaraderie uh, and the feeling of that board making a difference. So it's, it's amazing how I go back to the process again, it makes the board feel real. It's not just, well, I'm donating my time on a nonprofit, so you're gonna get from me what's, uh, what I think I can give you, right? That's not the way it works. The expectation has to be set. You can use your board pitch book for that, which by the way, it likely is gonna require the change of a few people on a board that just either can't dedicate the time that's required or simply don't wanna do it. They're gonna view it as too much work, right? You have to be willing to say, that uh, those particular people may not be a right fit for this board, but have a plan on how you rotate them in and out or create an emeritus, emeritus board uh, that they can roll off into where they're still involved. You haven't lost their connections and their contacts and maybe their love of the organization, but they're not hindering the decision-making and voting body, the board itself, because of their lack of time commitments or, or even, um, um, what would you say, their, their lack of, of love of the mission or the vision of the organization potentially. Oh, that's perfect. I like that. What would you tell a board of directors? How do they need to be prepared for the eventual changing of the guard at either the board president level or at the executive director level? Mm -hmm. There's there's some work in that. I, I like to think that um, most bylaws for nonprofit organizations, uh, if you're talking about the chair of the board specifically or, or the incoming chair, that has to be someone that served on the board for X number of years before they can take on that role. So hopefully you know that person by then and uh, you have some sort of background of how they operate, how they interact, uh, their demeanor, um, going back to uh, what, what type of leadership traits they have and if they're an analyst, sentinel, diplomat, or explorer, right? Um, so you have that understanding. But when we talk about succession planning, there is a lot of work in this. And this is not just true of nonprofit organizations, but in the private and especially in the public sector, um, the, the, what I would view as the globally accepted time frame to start that process, believe it or not, is five years in advance of someone leaving their position, whether it be as a CEO or as a board director. Now there's other things, of course, that play into that because you know certain uh, uh, time limits uh, and re mandatory retirement ages or term limits are set for certain board members, I get that. But you know that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a pipeline of folks that are lined up uh, at least for the next incoming chair of a board. Now, I would even expand this, Travis, to say that it's not just the chair of the overall board that's going to make or break that board. It's going to be the chair of the committee areas also that makes or breaks that board because the, the committees are the workhorse areas of the board. I see many boards that have, have um, maybe they're lacking true in-depth leadership at the board chair level, but they have phenomenal leadership in the board committee chair areas. And those boards do extremely well, right? Because they have that structure and they know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I'm not saying that the chair shouldn't be uh, you know, well-versed in their role and involved. That's not what I'm saying, but you know, it's really the combination of those areas. So that succession planning, there has to be a plan behind that. Um, I get involved in much of the succession planning of, of the clients I work with because it's so important to them. Um, and the amount of strife that can cause in an organization uh, is amazing. I mean, even just the, the stress that can cause if it happens to be too quick or too short a time frame of that transition, 
um, it can cause major disruptions in organizations. So you, you want to have a plan for that. Even if we go back to the marketing of that, right? There's a marketing component of that. You don't want major donors or those that are involved in your nonprofit organization to say, well, I had a connection with the previous chair. I don't have it with this one, right? The marketing plan for that should be an introduction by the current chair to the incoming chair. Do overlaps in that, right? Maybe you have a year overlap where a three or four year term is a chair. The first year is a... Uh, overlap with the previous chair and the last year of that service is an overlap with the incoming chair right that creates this level of of uh, not just understanding but uh, calmness in the board and the overall organization so that succession planning to your point travis is extremely important and there are processes you can put in place as i mentioned i i do that as one of my uh, consulting offering advisory offerings yeah i'm sure we could have a whole discussion just dedicated to that one area what does that look like for a board that is seeing the changeover of the executive director, the guy that's doing the work that's in the in the battlefield, so to speak? I know the average executive director is on board between three and five years. If they're only on board for three years, that doesn't give you five years of planning. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if you look at one of the main top three board of directors responsibilities above and beyond of course their more generic duty of care duty of loyalty and duty of obedience right if you break that down now and say what's one of their major tasks it's to select and evaluate the ceo and or the executive director of, of the nonprofit organization so to me that should always be top of mind and front of mind if you talk about an agenda there should always be something that's happening within a committee area that's being reported to the board uh, for input, oversight, agreement, disagreement, right? On where are we at in that process currently? Even if you have the strongest executive director in the organization, there should be discussions about what is that process? Should we need it overnight? If God forbid that executive director has some sort of issue, health issue, uh, passes away, whatever it may be. I've been working with boards where that's happened. Um, and what, where are we at in that life cycle of all times? Are we looking both internally and externally potentially for someone that could take that role? Do we have an interim pool of folks we could pull from, right? There are interim executive directors that that's their sole role for nonprofits. They, they can come, they can be brought in on a moment's notice and be that interim director. Um, executive director for the time being? Or is there someone that's acting and has the role and title of uh, an assistant executive director that can fill that gap in the short term? This all has to do with, with not just the succession, succession planning, but disaster recovery and business continuation planning. That to me should be integral of our responsibilities, of the responsibilities for a board of directors for any organization, inclusive of nonprofits. Oh, I think you're, am I on mute or you're, I think you're on mute. <laughs> this has been a jam packed hour of fun here, Mark. Where can people get a hold of you and where can they find your book? Sure. Well, I mean, all of this, uh, whether it be links to LinkedIn, because I love connecting with new people and following their content. Uh, there's links for my book uh, from my website as well. It's fisterstrategy.com. I will spell that out because my last name is a little strange. It's P-F-I-S-T-E-R strategy.com. Again, P-F-I-S-T-E-R strategy.com. Uh, and you can see my offerings there. You can get a link to, to pick up my book. Um, I've hosted, there's recorded webinars on there. There's certification courses you can do, a whole bunch of things that are specifically related to the board space. Uh, I like to think that this is the culmination of my career right now. And uh, you can use this as uh, both education as well as furthering some other areas of knowledge from, from my website directly. So I welcome you to visit there. Hey, thanks again, Mark. Really appreciate you having you on the show. Travis, thank you. Have a great day.